My name is Pastor Hal York. We'd like to welcome you to our online service at Hastings Park Bible Church. It's July the 10th, and if you're able to join us for our in-service uh, meeting, it's going to be at 10 o'clock this morning. But uh, we're glad you're able to join us online and trust you'll be blessed. Just a couple of announcements to draw our attention to. Our epic camps are coming up on August 15th to the 19th, and we'll be in prayer for them. And we're looking forward to that. It should be a great time for the kids, grades 1 to 6. And if you'd like to register your kids or no kids will be interested, there's, uh, you can go online at uh, our website, HastingsParkBibleChurch.com, and you can just click the Epic Camps link, and it can take you to the registration page, or there's some information there you can look at as well. The prayer meeting will be at 7 o'clock this week, and the men's Bible study at 7 on Thursday as well. But I'd like to just draw our attention to the Word of God to begin. And then there'll be some scripture reading and a few songs, and yeah, the announcements will be going by as well. The Psalm chapter 9 says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, will tell of all your wonders, and I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. For you have maintained my just cause, you have sat on the throne judging righteously. The Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the people with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning. Father, we are grateful for this time together to spend these moments reading scripture, singing these songs, and just looking into your word that you might teach us and instruct us. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for these wonderful words that have reminded us of your great care for your, your people, but also the fact that you are the judge of this world. You are sovereign over this world, sovereign over nations. And that every nation it is is there because you put them there, you, you raise them up, and you put them down as your will, as you so decree. But we thank you, Lord, for your, who you are. We thank you for your great love that you've shown us in Jesus Christ who came into this world to save his people from their sin. We thank you for the salvation that is so rich and so free in Jesus Christ and is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we come to worship you and celebrate that life that we now have in Christ and that you brought us back into a relationship with you. And we can now walk with you and have the joy of one day spending eternity with you because of all Christ has done for us. So bless us this morning as we worship, bless us this morning as we open your word together. We pray that you might open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Psalm 49. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all you who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked and deceivers surround me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough, so that they should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. People, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem me from this realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases. For they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them. Though while they live they count themselves blessed, and people praise you when you prosper, they will join those who have gone before them, who will never again see the light of life. People who have wealth but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we've been going through this book for several weeks now, and we're, gonna, we're sort of winding it up. We're down in verse, the last part of chapter 5, where we see some great truths that we want to be thinking about this morning. When we think about God's will for our life, we usually think about what he wants us to be doing, who we're going to marry, if we should marry, where we should live, where we should go to school, what, what should our job be, and so on. But when we think about the will of God, most always we're thinking about something that's outside of, of, of us, outside, it's out there, we're, something we're going to do. But scripturally, if you look at the will of God, the will of God in Scripture is more concerned with what is going on inside of us than it is outside of us, because what's going on in us will ultimately determine what's going on outside of us. But God is concerned with our holiness. If we know Christ, God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's conforming us into the image of Christ. He's constantly working in us to strengthen us, to mold us into his image to form us in holiness, practical holiness. We are obviously perfect in Christ, clothed with his perfect righteousness. But there's the practical aspect, the progressive sanctification that God is working in us. Because you know that's what glorifies him, but you know that's where true joy and blessedness is found in the Christian life, is in a holy life set apart for him. And that's a hard issue. It's not what we are doing, but what we are becoming that God is interested in our hearts, our wills, our passions, and our worship. And the verse that we want to key in on this morning is found in chapter 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. But we see here, verses 16, 17, and 18, three attitudes that characterize the inner life of the believer. We want to look at the first one this morning and the next two, Lord willing, next week. But let me just read them for you quickly. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The subject this morning is verse 16. Rejoice always. If you're looking to memorize a verse, there's a great one to memorize, and it doesn't get much easier than that. 
Rejoice always. Ever known people to, who seem to think gloominess and sadness and negativity is next to godliness? It's a sign of spirituality. It seems like they were baptized in vinegar. They consider it their sacred duty to be gloomy. But where in Scripture is the command to be miserable? Paul says it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus to rejoice always. For this is God's will for you. In 1 Thessalonians we just read. And Paul recognized the fact that I think that it was going to seem impractical, if not impossible. So he adds, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. This is not an option. This is not a, do you need a better reason? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What better reason do we need than that? Now, we could be here all day reading verses that teach us that rejoicing and joy at full attitudes are, are something that must abound in believers. Well, let me just give you a sampling. Proverbs 10, 28, the joy of the, 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 rather, the hope of the righteous brings joy. In Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah 12, 43, after Israel had this great revival, this great coming back to God and getting their life and their nation straightened out after the exile. They, at the end of all this, it says, For God had made them rejoice with great joy. But listen to this, And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. The Psalms are filled with calls to rejoice. Jesus, when he was here on earth, said to his disciples as he was getting ready to leave them and go to the cross, he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. When Paul wrote the Philippian church, he was writing them from a prison cell. And he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, is indeed not grievous, but for you it is safe. Rejoice in the Lord. Romans 5 Verses 2 and 3, through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Later on in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Here this book is, Romans, is so filled with this glorious theology of the Christian life, theology of the doctrine of the gospel, of our salvation in Jesus Christ and the sovereignty of God and all those things, but yet we're over and over reminded that theology should not make us gloomy and dull. Theology should be a cause of rejoicing in our life. It should produce joy and rejoicing. Rejoice always, Paul says. The inner rejoicing of the heart is what we want to think about this morning. And I just want to run some, over some things real quickly. Obvious things, I hope, to most. The things where we need to mind, re, be reminded of, because this is a very important exhortation. It's the will of God for us to rejoice always. The first thing we should notice is the context. It's set in the midst of our responsibilities. He talks about esteeming those who in love because of their work, the ones who labor over you in the Lord. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays evil for evil. Seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And rejoice always. There are certain things we do in certain situations. On Sunday, we go to church. When we see people who are faint-hearted, we want to help them. When we see people who are weak, we want to be patient with them. We admonish the unruly. Jesus says, in the world, we are going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. The King James Version says, I have overcome the world. 
We're not going to live our lives on the mountaintops, as we'll see in a moment. So it's said in the midst of everyday life, rejoice always. It's not a fleshly or a carnal rejoicing. If it were, it would be impossible to keep it up. There's a joy of having lots of wealth, but where, where is it when riches are gone? We rejoice when we have good health, but what about when our health is gone? We rejoice when we have lots of friends around, but what about when there's no more friends? If our rejoicing springs from earthly sources, those sources can, can and will dry up. Therefore, to the unbeliever, this exhortation to rejoice always will seem as ridiculous as it is implausible and unrealistic because they don't understand what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Third, it's not a presumptuous rejoicing. Some people shouldn't rejoice. The Bible says to Israel, Don't rejoice not, O Israel, for thou hast departed from your God. If you don't know God, you should not be rejoicing. You should be fearful. You should be fearful. You should be trembling because you're a heartbeat from eternity without Christ. There will be many for the joy who were so filled with happiness and myrrh in this world to have that turn to sorrow because so they might be aware of who they are in the eyes of God. They are lost. And they might see their sin and they might come and flee to Christ for refuge. They might have joy of sins forgiven. And sadly, there are many today sitting in churches who have a Joy based on a presumption of good works leading to a false assurance. A false hope is a fool's joy. Many will say to me in that day, Jesus said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform, perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, to 23. The presumption of salvation is a false joy. You need to examine yourselves to see and make sure you are in the faith, Paul says. We need to know for certain that our faith is real. And we're not just like the Pharisee that said, I thank you that I'm not like him, these other people, that I do this and I do that and I do that. And he had an assurance, a false assurance of his own goodness before God but he was still clothed in the, his own filthy rags of his own righteousness. And I'm sure he was like these people we read about. He thought one day he would see God, and he was rejoicing in that. But it was a false hope. And a false hope is a fool's joy. But number four, it's not even rejoicing when Christians feel on, which Christians feel on special occasions. We don't live on the mountaintops. There are moments like Peter and the disciples, Peter, James, and John had the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw Jesus transfigured into the, saw the glory of Christ shining through. And Peter says, let us build three tabernacles. But they didn't stay there. Every day will not be like that. That's not what Paul means by rejoice always, that every day is going to be this mountaintop experience. I think sometimes when kids go away to camp, and this camp's exciting, or we go away and to a conference, and it's exciting, and every day is just filled with more great teaching and great fellowship and great food, and it's just wonderful. But not every day is going to be like that. The ordinary joy of the Christian is not the joy of Christmas and Easter and special events or special days or special seasons. The ordinary joy of Christians is in the ordinary everyday life. We're always rejoicing every day, every ordinary day, every regular, mundane, get up in the morning, get the kids ready for school, you go to work, you come home kind of day. And we can be rejoicing and should be rejoicing in those kind of days. That's the Christian life. That's the Christian life. That's the life Paul lived. Every day for Paul wasn't just great big crusades. And Paul spent a lot of days sitting in jail cells, chained to a guard. You remember he and Silas were in the jail in Philippi, and they were singing and praising God. 
in the jail cell. So what does it mean to rejoice? What are we talking about here? Well, you need to really pay attention to this because it's not just about being happy. One writer described it this way, and I think it's a very good definition. What is rejoicing? It is the joy which God works in us by His Spirit, meaning this. Number one, the cheerfulness of the newborn disposition. We have become new creations in Jesus Christ. All things are passed away. All things have become new. He's put a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God. The cheerfulness of a newborn disposition, a delight in God, in Christ, whom we've now been brought into our relationship with, a trust in and willful agreement with divine providence. That's probably the, the big one. A trust in and willful agreement with divine providence and a peace that passes all understanding. That's what it means to rejoice. Those are the elements of a joyful heart. But this leads us to consider for a moment the objects of our rejoicing. Joy must have an object, a definable reason for its rejoicing, or it's just sheer emotionalism driven by events and the winds surrounding it. We can always rejoice in the Lord, God who is our exceeding joy. We can always rejoice in every doctrine, every promise and precept of the gospel. It will make us joyful. It will make us, give us cause to rejoice. We can rejoice because part of the work of the Spirit in our life is to give us faith and hope, and love and patience and joy. Spiritual disciplines such as prayer and singing and communion and serving and Bible study all lead and help us understand these things that we've just talked about and learn to rejoice in them even more. If our rejoicing does not come out of a clear understanding of the things of God, it has no foundation in the, it has no foundation in the Word of God. It will be blown away with the wind of changing moods and changing circumstances. The rejoicing of the Christian is sanctified common sense. We are to serve the Lord, sing to the Lord, pray to the Lord with a gladness of heart, a rejoicing heart. And this would be easy if it wasn't for that troublesome word. There's only two words in the verse, and guess which one's the troublesome verb? The troublesome word. Always. Rejoice. Always. Now, probably many of you are thinking, Paul, seriously? Well, remember, before you attack Paul, remember that all Scripture is given by, breathed out by God. This is God's word to us. He's t God is telling us through Paul, rejoice always. But I'm sure many of you are thinking, Paul, do you know the kind of world we live in? God, do you know the kind of world we're living in? And you know what he would say? Yes, I do. Do you see what's happening to believers today around the world? Yes, I do. Do you see the sin so rampant and unashamedly being paraded all over Canada, USA, and the world? Yes, I do. Do you know what's going on in my life right now? Yes, I do. And some would go far to say, Paul, how can you possibly say rejoice at all, let alone rejoice always? And how can we even think about rejoicing? Shouldn't we be cloaked in gloom and doom? How can we do this? Well, verse 17, I think, gives, leads us to the answer. And pray without ceasing. Verse 18 leads us to another step. And everything give thanks. To give thanks in all of our circumstances, not for them, but in them. 
Does any of that sound familiar? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Remember Philippians 4, 4? Paul, again, writing from prison, says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Then he says in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, what? But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and what's the result? The peace of God, rejoicing. The rejoicing that comes from an attitude of acceptance with the will of God and providence in our life. Paul Peter says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. One writer says, the marriage of rejoicing and prayer produced the offspring of thanksgiving. And we're going to look more at that next week. But these three simple commands call for a reorientation of our hearts, our minds, our will, our focus. Why is it so hard to rejoice always? Why is it so hard to do this? The flesh. What has to happen for us to rejoice always? To pray without ceasing? To in everything give thanks? What has to happen in our life? Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. Basically, to deny yourself and take up your cross means to die to self. The flesh has to be crucified. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet it is not I, but Christ lives in me. We must live a crucified life. The flesh must die daily. The flesh is all that selfishness and pride and the rebellion against God that still is contained within our flesh. His bondage over us has been broken because of the cross, because of our faith in Christ. But it's still there. It's still there. And it rebels against such self-denying commands of rejoice always and pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks. If we're going to rejoice... Always, self has to die. We have to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. Take up our cross and trust Him and love Him and live by faith and set our minds on Christ and not on the things of this world. If I could use an illustration that may help us a bit, help me anyway, Sometimes many children this week or next week will be going away to camp. Some of them maybe for the first time. I remember when I went to camp as a youngster, it wasn't something I particularly enjoyed. As a matter of fact, it might be better to state I hated it. I was not a, when I was young, I, got, I started to enjoy it more in my teenage years. But as a young person, I did not enjoy camp. We won't get into the reasons why, but I just didn't like it. But sometimes when children go to school for the first time, or maybe as a daycare or a summer camp for a week, it can be a very fearful, intimidating time, afraid, homesick, they're anxious or sad. And I remember all of those emotions. But sometimes putting something from home, or something that belongs to a parent, or something that they are familiar with, or has special meaning to them in their backpack. It reminds them of their home. It reminds them that they have not been abandoned. It reminds them that they were brought there by their parents who love them. It reminds them that mom and dad are coming to get them at the end of the day or the end of the week. And it helps them to calm down. It helps them to enjoy where they are. And having these comforts of home close at hand reminds them that they're going to be there soon. And as we wrap this up, may I give you some things that God has put in our backpacks, our hearts, 
some truths from Romans 8 that should remind us of who he is and what he wants us to know about himself and about the world we are living in. And that's the key to rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. And we're not going to rejoice always if if our rejoicing is based on anything but God himself, about who he is and what he's done for us in Christ. We could look at many of them. There are all kinds of them. But let me just give you a handful in Romans, a couple of handfuls in Romans chapter 8. You can look them up yourself. But here's some things that we need to pull out of our backpack There is therefore now no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus. You need to make sure that's in your backpack. God's put it there. Number nine, every believer has been given the Holy Spirit who lives within us, and we are sealed by that Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, we are children of God, verse 15. We're going to receive a new body, verse 23. The Spirit helps us pray, verse 26 and 27. God is working all things together for good, verse 28. We have been justified or being sanctified, and one day we'll be glorified. God's going to finish what he's started. Verses 29 and 30. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, God has given us his Son, and with us freely given us all things. Verse 33, who can bring any charge against God's people? Verse 34, Christ is interceding for us every day, every moment of every day. He's our advocate at the right hand of the Father, 1 John 2, 2. Verse 37, if we are in Christ, we are more than conquerors. Verse 37, then verse 35, no one, can sep- no one or nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Joy, rejoicing, springs from hope. But it is not just the joy of a message. It's the joy of what the message has done in my life. Joy springs from hope, but it's not just the joy of the gospel. It's the joy of what the gospel message has done in my life. What it has told me when believed, what has done has happened to me and to you. It's produced a joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. The message of the gospel is my sins have been forgiven. The sin's bondage over my life has been broken. It's a message that has brought me into a relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus Christ. That I've been born again to a living hope. That heaven is certain. If I go to prepare a place, I will come back and take you unto myself, Jesus said to his disciples. Hope without joy is not real hope. Hope without joy, hope without rejoice that does not cause us to rejoice, is not real hope. I was thinking this week about Job. We know the story of Job. Lost his ten children, lost his business, lost his health, everything. Everything the world says is what we can rejoice in. Everything that makes them happy. He lost it all. Had nothing left. And why did he lose it? Because God said to Satan, he was walking around, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, the only reason Job is serving you is because you've got him or a hedge around him. And because everything's coming up roses. He's got a wonderful life. He's got a successful business. Everything, you take that away, and you've, he, he'll turn us back on you in a heartbeat. Well, God knew that Job's heart was not fickle. He wasn't serving him because of those things. He was serving him because he loved him. And so God gave Satan permission to touch Job. And he destroyed his crops, his servants, his family, his children. It just bang, 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 just like that. One after the other, it was gone. But Job says an amazing thing in chapter 19, verse 25. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. 
How do you get through that? When you lay your head down on your pillow at night, yes, there's sorrow, heartbreak, pain. But how can you lay your head in your pillow at night? How can you rejoice through that? How can you do it? I know my Redeemer lives. And we could add so many other things to that. I know my Redeemer reigns. I know my Redeemer is sovereign over my life and over the circumstances of my life. I know my Redeemer cares for me. I know my Redeemer is good and His loving kindness is real. I know my Redeemer loves me. I know my Redeemer is working all things together for good in my life. Rejoice always. The word always implies truth will never change. God does not change. His promises, therefore, never change. They never need to be updated. They never need to be amended. We can always rejoice because God is always the same. Always. I do not change. Think of Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.10. He says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. The world can't not comprehend that. It's either or, not both. But for the believer, for the believer, when we lay our heads in our pillows at night, when we look at the things that happen to us in our life, And we believe those things that we just looked at. And then we rejoice in them. We've embraced them. And they're what we look at, what we think about. Yes, the rug may get pulled out from underneath us at times. But yet we know we've been born again. And this new song is still there. We delight in God and in Christ. We have trust and a willful agreement with divine providence. And therefore, when we lay our heads on our pillows at night, there's a peace that passes understanding. As we think about the events of our life and all the things that are going on in our life, maybe it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of our health, but whatever, the loss of our business, the loss of a child, or just setbacks in life, discouragements in life. As we look at them, what filter do we look at them through? Do we look at them through the filter of Scripture, through the filter of God, our Father, who loves us, and none of this has taken Him by storm? All of this has come into our life for a purpose, for a design. And even though we're sorrowing in our heart, deep down, there's a joy. Because we know this is not just some haphazard event. We know there's this well springing up. And even though our heart is breaking, we know that our God lives. And he reigns. And he cares. And he understands. And he's there with us. And so we can be sorrowful. Yet always rejoicing. It doesn't mean sorrowful, but always having a party. Always smiling. Always carefree. No, we're sorrowful. We're not, we don't have our heads stuck in the sand. We're sorrowful. But as we consider these things, there's this welling up of joy. Because we know. We know who we belong to. We know God loves us and he cares for us. And we know that our happiness is not depending upon the things that are around us, but what God is doing in us. The outward man may be perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day by day. James, I think, alludes to this. Consider it. Consider it. Think. <clears throat> Christian life is rejoicing is sanctified common sense. Consider, think, reason. 
Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Why, James, why, oh, why would you say this? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience and patience experience and so on. Does that mean that we will always be able to dis- understand the re- redemptive nature, the chronic illness or cancer diagnosis or the tragic death of a loved one? Certainly not this side of glory. We may never understand that. But our peace and our rejoicing is not in our understanding. Our joy and our rejoicing is not in understanding why, but in understanding who. Who holds us in the palm of his hand? Who holds our circumstances? Who brought us here? It was God. He's working. He's working. He has a purpose and a plan. He brought us here for a purpose. And apart from grace, the outward circumstances of our situation lead only to self-pity and the doubt of God. But the unchanging author of Scripture and God's redemptive work in Christ Jesus have led us to discover in Him, in Him, not in our circumstances, but in Him, a much deeper joy. A joy that is known by His children alone. A rejoicing that transcends our circumstances. We have not been abandoned. Christ is coming back. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. We are not alone. Let not your heart be troubled. If I go away, I've gone away to prepare a place for you, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back. In this, we can rejoice and will rejoice. God doesn't change. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, it says, If we of all people in this life have faith in Christ only in this life, if we have faith in Christ only in this life, we are of all people to be most pitied. To be most miserable. If the resurrection of Christ is not true, then we should be the most pitiable, miserable people on earth. But He has risen. He has. Do you know that? If you're struggling with these things this morning, may I encourage you to open your backpack, to read the Word of God. To walk and live as you do, delighting in Him. Being the the cheerfulness of the newborn disposition, a delight in God and Christ, a trust in the willful agreement with divine providence will produce a peace that passes understanding. And it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's what God has put in your knapsack. That's what God wants you to unpack in your life every day. And when you do, you will be able to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. What's in your backpack? Is it bitterness? Is it doubt? Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it fear? If that's there, you put it there. And before, that, before you can rejoice in what God has put there, you've got to get rid of that. You've got to put that in, and that will drive it out. You've got to start believing the Word of God, trusting in the Word of God. Open your backpack. Read the Word of God. Study it. Memorize it. Believe it. Act upon it. Obey it. Live it. Delighting in Him. Demonstrating the cheerfulness of the newborn disposition. Christ lives in us, the hope of glory. The Spirit of God is, wants to fill us, and the fruit of that Spirit is love and joy and peace. Delight in Him. Trust in God's willful agreement. Trust in a, a willful agreement with divine providence. 
Trust what God is doing in your life. Trust that he's working in your life. We may not understand all the things he does in our life, but we need to believe that he's working. And then we lay our heads in our pillows at night. We go into the lunch break room with our friends or colleagues. We go to work and we drive our car when we're thinking about our life. We keep pulling out these truths. And as hard as our life may be at times and as difficult, we know God is there. God will never give us more than we can bear. Or the basically, better way to put it, God will never give us more than he can bear in us. And even though there's sorrow, there's just joy, rejoicing that we know our God is in control. Our God reigns. And if this, God didn't want this to happen, it would not have happened. God reigns over our life. God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. And he loves us. And he saved us. And he's coming back for us. And he has a place prepared for us. And may that spring just continue to bubble up in our hearts. And overpower the discouragement, the sadness. That we have to believe it. Or it will do nothing. Paul ends chapter 15, that great chapter in the resurrection of Christ this way. And I'll close with this verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the toil, knowing that in the Lord your toil is not in vain. So rejoice always. And again I say, rejoice. Let's close in prayer. Father, we pray you'll take these words and drive them deep down into our hearts, for the very practical very personal. But Father, we pray, Lord, you know what's going on in each heart. You know what we, every one of us have in our backpacks this morning, what we put there. But Father, may we empty our backpacks with the stuff we put there and allow what you want to be in there to be there. May these truths be like a well of water in our lives as they are and springing up, refreshing us, in the most darkest of days, in the most difficult of days, that this spring of living water that does not change and does not end it will be constantly springing up in us. And even though we may be sorrowful, as Paul says, we are always rejoicing. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so, Father, may these truths encourage us and equip us to go out into this world and shine it's lights. There's nothing shiny about grumpy, miserable people. But may we go out as this water springing up in us and shining as light in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. A generation is dying of thirst, spiritual thirst. They have nothing. We have the living water of Jesus Christ living in us. And it's a well that will never run dry. It's a well that satisfies us to the full. And may that be evident in how we live and how we think, how we reason. And may the world see it as they saw, may they see the joy in God's people. To your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.